Du Fu at office manager Wei Feng's house. I saw a painting of horses by General Cao Ba. Since the founding of our nation, of all who painted horses, the greatest by far was the Prince of Jiangdu. But then came General Cao, who after 30 years of a warrior's fame, gave the world again some truly shining steeds. <clears throat> he painted the former emperor's luminous mount, and thunder crashed for ten days above the dragon pool. In the palace treasury there was a dark red agate plate. Ladies of handsome fairness passed the word for ladies of talents to find it. Presented with a plate, the general paid deep homage and went home. White silks and sheer satins followed him there, one after another. The noble and the powerful all commissioned paintings and began to see their screens and panels shine with dazzling light. From the old days, Taizong's horse Tang curls, and later times, Guo Ziyu's lion flower. Both are in his latest painting. Once again, the connoisseurs cannot stop their sighing. On any of these horses, one cavalryman could defeat ten thousand. Beneath his brush, white silk has become the frontier's windswept desert. The other seven horses are also splendid steeds. In the distance, cold sky blends with mist and snow. Frosted hooves kick the long road between catalpas. Grooms and servants stand in rows like forest trees. Marvel how these nine horses, in spirited competition, lift their heads high with dignity and pride. Who, you may ask, most deeply loves, best knows these horses. In our days, Wei Feng. Before him, Zhi Dun. I remember when the emperor travelled to the Xin Feng palace. Kingfisher banners brushed the sky as they travelled east. Prancing in a great mass, 30,000 horses each one a painted image, come to life. When funeral gifts were offered to the river gods, heroic deeds like water dragon hands were ended. Don't you see, sir, the golden tomb is overgrown with pine and cypress. All traces of his court are gone. Only birds cry in the wind. Okay, so another poem by Du Fu. It had been some time since we had encountered poems of the Sage of Poetry. And this is a relatively big poem. Uh, we might imagine that this was composed uh, relatively late in Du Fu's life, that is, in the time well after the An Lushan Rebellion, well, no, a few years after, where uh, Du Fu, after not, uh, not being recognized or given important posts in office, went uh, west and uh, found a temporary respite, a temporary refuge, in the province of Sichuan. He lived in a small hut outside the city of Chengdu. There he met this man, this office manager, Wei Feng, who I imagine was a friend and perhaps a patron. In this poem, uh, we get uh, a description. Uh, du Fu is watching some paintings of horses that are in Wei Feng's house. Concretely, one painting, a recent painting, supposedly painted by General Cao Ba. So, the topic of this poem is going to be uh, ekphrastic. It's going to be the description of a painting, and because the painting is a painting depicting horses, it's going to be in praise of the painter of the painting as a great artist, as a master artist, but also, you know, it's going to be about horses. 
and we will talk about the importance of horses in a minute for Tang Dynasty people. There's also a nostalgic tone in this poem. Uh, we will mention why, but there are reminiscences of better times in the past, better times when uh, the emperor who Du Fu mostly served, Shuan Song, was still on the throne, or enjoying glory and success. Uh, also for the for the for the painter himself, a general Cao Ba, although that is not directly referenced in the poem. So topics: uh, ekphrases describing uh, a painter's mastery of his art and his powerful ability at depicting his topic, horses, which are the topic, and reminiscences of the past. So, uh, not much to say about Wei Feng. He wasn't a powerful official or a relevant one, as far as I know. Now, this General Cao Ba, General Cao Ba, he was a descendant of a very, very famous uh, general in Chinese history, Cao Cao, who eventually became, uh, after death, posthumously, the first uh, emperor of the Wei dynasty. And he was a great warrior and a great poet, although he has been maligned by uh, traditional Chinese opera. Uh, so this general Cao Ba is his descendant. He was a great painter of the Tang period. In spite of his title as a general, he was really more proficient with the brush than with the sword. In fact, I think the title of general was probably, uh, you know, an honor that was bestowed upon him because of his artistic abilities and family background by Emperor Xuanzong. Sad story, General Cao Ba. He he was, as this poem has depicted, very successful, very appreciated as an artist. But and he was, you know, he became dirty rich. But when the Alushan Rebellion broke out, the capital fell into the hands of the barbarians. Uh, Cao Ba was completely impoverished, and uh, in in his last days, he was forced to paint for for just for for surviving. Yeah, being given some charity, some coins by uh, peasants or, or poor people who thought him a beggar or a peddler. So, you know, a big change uh, from riches to rags, instead of from rags to riches, as happened so much during the Anushan Rebellion. Uh, what else can we say? So, ekphrasis. Uh, ekphrasis is very important in Western poetry. I think I mentioned this already in a previous video. Ekphrasis basically means describing words of art through a poem. Now, this happens in the oldest poems in the Western tradition, for example, in the Iliad, and uh, Roman poet uh, Horace uh, emphasized this union or this desirable union between pictures and poems with a famous line, ut pictura poiesis, yeah? uh, well, of, of, of a person who can paint, uh, who is such a good artist that he can paint pictures with words, paint pictures with poetry. Uh, this and the next poem are both ekphrases of Du Fu based on uh, pictures and paintings by that, by that artist and general Cao Ba. Now horses, why horses? Now horses were very, very important and symbolic in ancient China, and especially during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, horses were a difficult animal to breed in the Chinese heartland because you know they require big pasture lands of which there wasn't a, an abundance in uh, traditional China. In fact, most horses were bought or captured or imported from the steppe, from the northwest, from the barbarians who cultivated them. Now, horses were necessary, as they were expensive, they were necessary as uh, war gear, as, as, as war machines for, for, for the big Tang imperial armies. They were also uh, a luxurious item, they were considered beautiful. And uh, the Tang Dynasty, uh, this is uh, frequently emphasized, came from, was, you know, semi-barbarian. Uh, part of the ancestors of the Tang Dynasty were, well, part of them were Chinese, but part of them were barbarians. In fact, the, the ancestors of the Tang had been, mm, had been uh, ministers serving the barbaric Din dynasties that ruled northern China during the period of disunion. And they had assimilated the semi-barbaric, semi-nomadic culture of the Northwest. The Tang emperors enjoyed horse riding, enjoyed hunting on horseback. They enjoyed uh, playing games on the back of horses, like polo, for example, which was a very popular game at the, at the Tang court. So horses were very appreciated. They appeared in Tang art, in Tang painting, as a subgenre, the horse painting. Unfortunately, we haven't preserved many of those, but there are some copies 
there are also some mural paintings of the town with horses, and there are sculptures at funerary complexes. So horses were very, very important symbolically and culturally at this time period. So let's uh, start analyzing the poem couplet by couplet, and uh, it goes like this. Uh, it has some dark aspects. It's, it's, a, it's a poem that has some allusions, cultural allusions, that are a bit dark to understand. So let's uh, go piece by piece and try to clarify them. So first couplet, since the founding of our nation, of all who painted horses, the greatest by far, was the prince of Jiangdu. So the genre of horse painting is probably relatively old. By the time of the Tang Dynasty, it probably had at least 200 or 300 years of antiquity. Uh, and Du Fu starts by, you know, indirectly praising the royal house. He says, the greatest painter of horses, probably he is sincere, is the prince of Jiangdu, who was a member of the, of the Li imperial clan of the Tang Dynasty, Li Shu, a nephew of Emperor Taizong. So, okay, this is a great painter, the greatest of all time, four horses. But then came General Zhao, who after 30 years of a warrior's fame, gave the world again some truly shining steeds. So the Prince of Jiangdu was a great painter, perhaps a couple of generations back from Du Fu, but now in the present we have General Zhao, uh, who after accumulating fame for 30 years, martial fame, I'm, I'm not sure, but perhaps he did fight in, in the frontiers, but who now has finally brought beautiful horses back to life or back to the world of painting. In fact, I think in the poem, the, the reference, uh, it's a, the explicit mention is made of uh, a Chen Huang, who was a famous uh, legendary creature and probably a famous horse of the past. Okay, so we've begun. The Prince of Jiangdu is a great painter, but General Cao is an even better painter. So let's learn in the next stanza. This was the first stanza in, the, in this version of the poem by uh, Geoffrey Waters. The next stanza continues describing us the merit and the recognition of this General Cao, who is not only by Du Fu, he is accepted by others as a master poet, sorry, as a master painter, as a master horse painter. He painted the former emperor's luminous mount and thunder crushed for ten days above the dragon pool. So he painted for the former emperor. The former emperor in this case would be Xuanzang, the greatest emperor, or probably one of the greatest emperors of the Tang dynasty, who led uh, that dynasty through a period of maximum splendor, power and wealth during the first half of the 8th century. After experiencing a sudden turn of fortunes with the Anushan Rebellion, he had to run away, abandon his capitals, and he retired and abdicated in, uh, in Sichuan. And he probably was dead by the time of composing this poem. Well, he was, because there is a reference to his tomb at the end of the poem. So he would have been a, an emperor that was uh, remembered with nostalgia. So. This general Zawa painted the, the famous, one of the famous horses of the emperor, yeah? and uh, a horse that was called White That Shines by Night. And after painting it, he says, and thunder crashed for 10 days above the dragon pool. What does this mean? Well, the dragon pool was a pool in the, one of the imperial palaces, in the Xing Qing Palace. And uh, it was supposed to be uh, the residence of a dragon. And it was also associated with Xuanzang's rise to power. So what, what, what is being implied here is that the dragon that is dwelling in the pool is reacting, is responding to the quality of Cao Ba's horse painting. After the painting of uh, the emperor's horse is made, the dragon in the pool reacts excitedly to this beautiful painting. But not only the dragon, the emperor and his concubines and wives also react and decide to reward the painter as the next couplet tells us. In the palace treasury, there was a dark red agate plate. Ladies of handsome fairness passed the word for ladies of talents to find it. So in the palace treasury, there is this great plate, a beautiful work of art of, of, of carved uh, semi-precious stone. And the different concubines of the emperor 
tell their servants to bring to find in the palace treasury this this marvelous artwork because they're going to bestow it as a gift on the painter Zauba. So next stanza with two couplets and con it continues the story. So the gift is this, this marvelous red agate plate is given to the painter and his fame extends now beyond the walls of the palace and all the aristocrats try to get paintings from him and try to bribe him or persuade him with gifts to work for them. Presented with the plate, the general paid deep homage and went home. White silks and sheer satins followed him there, one after another, probably sent from the court or perhaps sent from these nobles who want to court the painter's favour. The noble and the powerful all commissioned paintings and began to see their screens and panels shine with dazzling light. So the painting of uh, the paintings of Tsava are so beautiful they, uh, they you know they make the, the, the surfaces where they're painted glow they make them radiant dazzling shiny okay so after this general introduction of uh, General Tsava as a painter we now get into the, the specific painting that presumably Du Fu is looking at at uh, office uh, manager Wei Feng's house this stanza, uh, in fact, the following two stanzas are going to describe this painting and the horses that appear therein. From the old days, Taizong's horse, Tan Curls, and later times, Guo Ziji's Lion Flower. Both are in his latest painting. Once again, the connoisseurs cannot stop their sign. So General Saoba's last painting is another piece de resistance. It's a, a great masterwork that moves everybody. Among the things that appear in it are two horses from the past, from the glorious, well, not so not so ancient, but from the glorious past. So Taizong's horse, Tan Curls, appear, uh, appear in the picture. He appears in the, it appears in the picture. Taizong, the greatest uh, emperor of the Tang Dynasty, the second emperor, the one who mostly expanded the borders of the empire and uh, conquered the Turks and became their ruler for a time. So Taizong's horse, Tan Curls, is in the painting. Also, Guo Zizhi's lion, lion flower. So the, this was um, this uh, was a, a horse that belonged uh, to, I think, Emperor Xuanzong, and it was given as a gift to the Guo family. So these two beautiful horses, one from a couple of generations back, another from, from the present almost, appear in the painting. And they're beautiful. On any of these horses, one cavalryman could defeat 10,000. Beneath his brush, white silk has become the frontier's windswept desert. So marvelous painting, marvelous horses. These horses are worth ten thousand other normal horses, and in the painting uh, we have the horses and we have the background of the steppe of the frontier. Uh, beneath his brush, white silk. Yeah, because paintings at this time were mostly done on silk. Paper was uh, discovered in China. I think it was in the uh, in the Tang Dynasty at this time, approximately in the eighth century. Before that. Documents uh, were written on bamboo, mostly on bamboo slips that were then tied together. And some paintings or some very precious texts were written on silk. And paintings like this one were painted in silk. Okay, let's continue with other things that also appear in the painting. Not only these two super horses, there are other nice looking ones as well. The other seven horses are also splendid steeds. In the distance, a cold sky blends with mist and snow. Frosted hooves kick the long road between catalpas. Grooms and servants stand in rows like forest trees. The background, the other elements of the painting are described. So we have the other horses, the cold sky, there are trees, there are attendants and grooms next to the horses. Marvel how these nine horses, in spirited competition, lift their heads high 
with dignity and pride. The artist is so good, he's able to depict the horses, not only in a realistic way, but in a way that emphasizes their dignity, their nobility, their superiority, their aristocratic courtings, we could say. And this stanza concludes, Who, you may ask, most deeply loves and best knows these horses? In our days, when Wei Feng, before him, Ji Dun. So just as in the beginning, uh, we had the two greatest uh, horse painters, the Prince of Jiangdu and General Cao. Now, in this couplet, we have the two foremost appreciators of horse paintings and of horses, which are in the, in the present, Wei Feng. This is probably a bit of flattery towards uh, the person in whose house he is appreciating the painting. Before him, Ji Dun. Ji Dun was a monk from uh, the Eastern Jin period. I've read a few anecdotes about him in the Shi Shuo Xin Yu, but uh, I don't remember that he had a reputation for being, uh, you know, especially fond of horses, but it seems he probably was. Okay, finally, the last stanza. Uh, up to now, we've been basically getting a description of, 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 of this painting and this painter. The last stanza is, uh, you know, a, 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 takes us back in time. It's a, a reminiscence to the times, the glorious times in which Cao Bao was painting horse paintings for the emperor and when Emperor Xuanzang was the ruler, the golden age of the Tang dynasty. I remember when the emperor traveled to the Xing Feng palace. King Fisher banners rushed to the sky as they traveled east. So in this reverie, Du Fu remembers the days when the emperor went to the Xing Feng Palace. Now, the Xing Feng Palace, I think, is another name for the Hua Qing Springs Palace, which was uh, one of the palatial complexes that Emperor Xuanzang had. It was about 25 uh, kilometers east of the capital, Chang'an, and it was famous because it was there that he mainly enjoyed the company and the pleasures of his beloved uh, wife, Jiang Guifei of whom we will talk later on. She became one of those famous kingdom toppling beauties of which uh, Chinese poetry speaks a lot. And a lot of romances and poems developed around her tragic end, as well as the fall from power of Emperor Xuanzang. So Du Fu recalls when long caravans of horses, of bedecked beautiful horses with kingfisher banners, traveled uh, to that palace from the capital uh, to the east. Prancing in a great mass, 30,000 horses, each one a painted image, come to life. So here we get an inverse ekphrasis. Dufu is remembering a huge procession of many horses accompanying the imperial cortege to that eastern palace. And in the painting of his imagination, he is imagining the horses. Yeah? And each one, a painted image, come to life. So instead of going, like in the previous stanzas, from the painting to the horse, now he is going from the horses, he remembers, to the painting. I mean, the real horses, although they are the real horses of his memory, of his imagination, are equated, are associated with painted images. They are like painted images come to life. The order of, of, of priorities seems to change between the natural and the artificial. Uh, next couplet. When funeral gifts were offered to the river gods, heroic deeds like water dragon hands were ended. Don't you see, sir, the golden tomb is overgrown with pine and cypress. All traces of his court are gone, only birds cry in the wind. Now the ending of this poem is very, it's quite hermetic. Now, the general meaning of, of these two couplets, or this three or this, a little bit of more than two couplets, is to reminisce, reminisce the death and the burial and the disappearance of Emperor Xuanzang. And the golden tomb that is mentioned uh, is the tomb of Emperor Xuanzang. It's overgrown now with pine and cypresses. All traces of that court are gone away. Only the birds cry now in the wind. Only Xuanzang and his glory only live in memory. And his tomb lies forlorn and semi-abandoned, except by the birds. 
when funeral gifts were offered to the river god, heroic deeds like water dragon hands were ended. So I think from what I've checked uh, in, in another book, this seems to be a reference. So this is translated in a slightly different but similar way in essence. For example, by uh, Paul Kroll, who is a great expert on Lufu. He translates it as, if ever, even since he offered the jewels, bringing the Jello river god to audience, there will be no more shooting krakens in the waters of the Jiangsu. Anyway, these two references are, are references to previous emperors. Um, so when, when, the, when the poet says, um, when funeral gifts were offered to the river gods, he is thinking at the same time of the funerary rituals that were done at the burial of Emperor Xuanzong, and he is thinking of an episode in ancient Chinese history when King Mu of Zhou made a journey to the west and presented jewels to the god of the Yellow River, after which the god came to a court audience. So this trip of King Mu to the west is probably referenced here uh, and connected with Emperor Xuanzong because Emperor Xuanzong also had to fly to go to the west. In his case, it wasn't just a happy journey. He was fleeing from uh, the Anglishan troops. So this reference to the funeral gifts offered to the river gods connects with an emperor who traveled west, but also, and like, like Xuanzang had to travel west in more tragic circumstances, but probably the idea of funeral gifts connects to the idea of remembering the funeral uh, and the funeral offerings made for Xuanzang when he died and when he was buried. And this, uh, heroic deeds like water dragon hands were ended. So when the emperor died, hands of water dragons came to an end. This is yet another reference to another emperor of the past. So there is a double reference to Xuanzong and uh, to, uh, to, to another emperor, Han Wudi, who in, in, in the old legends had allegedly shot a kraken-like creature in the waters. And Xuanzong was very often compared to Han Wudi as they all both had been very successful and powerful emperors. So, so what we are implying here with the fact that the heroic deeds these hands have ended is that Emperor Xuanzong has died. It's a very oblique way of referring to his death. And uh, that's it. Uh, the, the last couplet that we've already commented describes Xuanzong's tomb. So quite a sad, melancholy poem at the end. Yeah, it evokes uh, the passage of glory, the passage of time. It was mostly about describing a beautiful work of art and, and the horses, but it, the poem slowly, through its references, through its memories of the past, through its references to horse paintings of ancient times, you know, it ended up tying in that tapestry of a mere description of a great work of art, a reminiscence, a nostalgic memory of the times in which Cao Ba and Emperor Xuanzong lived and basked in the golden splendor of the dynasty. Golden splendor that ends with the golden tomb, not so golden now, overcome with pine and cypress. The Tang dynasty has passed its glory. And uh, all traces of that glory, like the birds and like the court of Xuanzang, are gone. Only birds cry in the wind. In this case, Du Fu is himself a bird, singing his sweet, melancholy song in the wind. Quite a nice poem. Uh, du Fu never disappoints.